Shavu Atov. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is, is doing well, had a nice Shabbat. And as I know, the world is sort of heading quasi back into lockdown and all kinds of crazy things, which hope uh, we have to hear good news and good things, even though I understand Canada is going to be put on the red list from uh, Israel today. So uh, even, even Canada is going to join the list where you, you, you can't come, even if we invite you, Rabbi Leaptak. But hopefully soon. Please, God, this will be a much less severe variant. They don't know yet, but let's pr pray and hope that it is that way and that we should all be well. And uh, now we'll go to number seven in Vayikra. Rabbi Leaptak, welcome back to Israel. Vakasha. Okay, thank you, Rabbi. Um, let me share my screen. And here we are. Okay, so Shemitah number seven is class 11. <coughs> but the last two weeks, we were talking more about eight and seven because we took advantage of the Hanukkah season. And we talked about Hanukkah and from seven to eight, but primarily Hanukkah. So now we have to go back to the number seven <coughs> in our main topic. So just a quick review of what we did in the very beginning. Uh, we, very, we began with the rhythms of nature and the connection between seven and nature. And the idea we talked about is that our day-to-day -day lives are pretty much controlled by the 24-hour day, day and night, day and night, like the natural rhythm of the 24-hour day. And just like our individual lives are controlled by the cycles of the 24-hour day with sunrise, sunset, in the same way our agricultural year, our, pretty much our, our economy and our commerce, our fiscal year, is uh, pretty much set by the seasons, by the 365-day well, the year. It's not just 365 days. It's the it's the rhythm of spring, fall, uh, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall, the seasons, which affects our economy and affects our day to day lives and our and our schedules. And then what we do, uh, starting with the story of creation, we take a non natural cycle of seven, and we put and we sort of impose or superimpose a divine cycle of seven onto the natural cycle of the 24 hour day, and that sort of brings God into our day-to-day -day life. And just like we bring, um, once every seven days, we keep Shabbat, we take the natural rhythm of the 24-hour day, we take the natural rhythm of a 365-day year, and we have the Shemitah cycle. That's, that's what we talked about in the very beginning. And that's why the seven days of creation are coming to set a new cycle, a new rhythm, um, because in those seven days of creation, God basically creates what we call nature. It began with things out of order, random, and by the time it's over, by the time six days are over, we have what we call nature, we have growth, we have the sun, the moon, the stars, vegetation, animals, basically all the powers of nature, and hence God's name, Elohim, the many powers. There's really one God who made everything. And then that's the background to understanding um, God's relationship with all civilization, and later you know, making man in God's image with creativity, and later a special relationship with Am Yisrael. Now, in light of that, we talked about the connection between Shabbat and Shemitah. That's just the, the similar words, but basically the concept of separating one day out of a seven weeks, I'm sorry, one day out of seven days of a week, giving a special status. But the purpose of that separation was for the sake to bring God into the six days that we work. In the same way, we make one year special, the Shemitah year, and we take the theme of that Shemitah year and that's going to become the funnel that brings godliness into the six years that we're working. Just like Shabbat brings God into the six days that we work during the week, Shemitah brings God into the six uh, years that we work in our economy. Um, in later shirim, we're going to go back and try to find a deeper meaning to all that. But I just want to do one last review, which I don't think we do too much in detail, uh, because it's going to take us into nature and, uh, and seven. And it'll take us right into Sefer Vayikra. We're going to start in Shemot. Because after we get the Ten Commandments and Sefer Shemot, we have a unit, which we call Parshat Mishpatim, three chapters of laws that sort of take the principles of the Ten Commandments and apply them to day-to-day -day life. Uh, we had a set of uh, jurisprudence, what we call Nisikin laws for, for Beitin, in the first half, the first two chapters. And then in chapter 23, the third chapter of Parshat Mishpatim, we go more into ethical laws. And we conclude, even though most of the laws are between God and man, are between man and man, the, the final section leads into the three pilgrimage holidays, which is between God and man. So let's just read the ending in chapter 23 in Shemot, Pasachet. Not to take shoch, not to take bribe, for shoch ad lotikach, ki ashoch ad yaver pichim v'sadev tivrei tzadikim. Just giving examples of laws of ethical behavior. And the grand finale, that unit was v'ger lotochatz, not to oppress a stranger, and you of all people, 
But temi datem nefesh hagir, you have to learn from your experience in Egypt. You know what it feels like to be a stranger because you were strangers in Egypt. Therefore, don't oppress in your society when you become the powerful one. Don't do what the Egyptians said to you. Now, after finishing that ethical that uh, set of laws of ethical behavior, we move into Shabbat and Shemitah. How's, and here's the first time we have Shemitah and Chomish. <clears throat> in the meantime, Shemitah is actually called Shemitah to sort of let go or release. Six years, you work your land. I call that, that's our basic national economy on the, on the fiscal year, the agricultural year, because Tizra Tarzecha, that's agriculture. And then you gather your produce, that's all, some, all spring and summer long. In the seventh year, Vashvi, Tishmetenun Tashta, you sort of let go, let it lay fallow. And what do we do with the produce of that year? The extra produce that you don't need, remember you're allowed to eat what you need for, the, for your own survival a day at a time, but the leftovers go for the poor people who don't own land. And the rest let the animals eat, which seems, again, we'll have to talk about this later, it seems the main things that you can take. The purpose of Shemitah is not to feed the poor. There's other laws to take care of the poor. The main law is you can take. A whole year, you can only take as much as you need. And you have basically called no capital gain that year, only survival and basically maintenance. And therefore, the leftovers let poor people eat because they don't own land. And the rest that the animals eat, it. the main thing is you can't take it. So that's six years to work. The seventh year, let go and don't work. In similar manner, you're supposed to work six days a week, and the seventh day, you rest. So this was the uh, cycle of the year, the natural cycle of, a, of the year, which is the rhythm of nature. And upon that, we impose the seven-year Shemitah cycle, just like the natural cycle of a day. And we impose upon that a divine cycle of seven. Now, I want to show you how this takes us right into agriculture. Why? We have a summary of all the laws of Parshat Mishpatim. All these laws from chapter 12, this is the Ten Commandments. Everything I told you for the Ten Commandments and all the laws of Parshat Mishpatim, make sure to keep. And therefore, don't mention the names of other gods. And this is Elohim, not Elohim. This is, don't mention the names of other gods. Don't mention them. Who are these other gods? I want to suggest it's referring to the gods of nature. Rain gods, fertility gods, the Canaanite gods, like Baal and Asherah. Instead, three times a year, I want you to see me. When? on the agricultural times of the year. So again, we start with Shabbat and Shemitah, <coughs> but Shemitah here, for Shemitah and then Shabbat, Shemitah is definitely agricultural. And now to make sure we remember that agriculture is not a function of many gods. Now there is no rain god or fertility god or grain god or whatever uh, ancient man thought, but rather all those powers of nature, they control your life but you have to remember that God's in charge of them. And the main thing isn't that you have to pray to God for your produce, rather, you have to remember that your produce and the welfare of your economy is a function of your deeds. Keep all the laws of Parshat Mishpatim and I'll bless your land. And therefore, you come to God on the three pilgrimage holidays, which is Chag Matzot, which is when in Chodesh Aviv in the spring, that's the beginning of our grain harvest, and then the Chag Katsir, our grain harvest. And what you plant in the field, and then in your uh, fruit harvest, circus time, at the end of the year, when you gather all your things from the field. What does God want you to do? These three critical times of the agricultural year, instead of going to other gods, I want you to see you, uh, God wants to see you at his office, you come to the Beit HaMikdash, and remember, not that you have to pray to God for grain, but you have to pray to God to remember that your grain and your agriculture and your economy is a function of your deeds and your society. And that's going to be, we explained before, that's the key difference between uh, Judaism and, and idol worship. Where in idol worship, there's powers that are in charge of grain, in charge of nature, and you pray to those powers directly for nature to be on your side, whatever that power might be. And in Judaism, there's one God in charge of all the powers of nature, and we pray to God to remember that he's in charge, but he uses agriculture and nature and natural phenomena he uses them as a tool either to reward us or punish us based on our behavior. And that theme is all through all the talk of Chot and Chumash. We say it every day in Shema. And that becomes a revolutionary idea because then um, there's a connection between your ethical behavior. If you follow the laws of Parshat Mishpatim, which is primarily how we treat one another in our society, then God will bless the land. 
And we need to remember three times a year on the critical times that if we want God to bless our land, it's a function of our deeds. Now, if people internalize that idea, that leads to a just society, because then if people want food on the table and want a good, strong economy, and they know that their economy is a function not only of their prayer and their beliefs, but rather their deeds and how they act in the society they build, that should sort of encourage and enhance a just society. And that society is going to represent God. So, so I use that. That's a summary of what we talked about in the opening shurim. I hope that's a summary. Now, with that in mind, I want to use that to explain Sefer, Sefer Vayikra. I mean, not all Vayikra, but one section of Vayikra. But to appreciate it, I need to review quickly something I'm, I'm hoping everyone knows, but some people don't. So I want to just review it real quickly. We talked about the cycle of the agricultural year. The biggest difference, what's sort of special about Israel and Israel's economy, as opposed to Egypt, there's no rain all summer long. And therefore, from Pesach to Sukkot, basically, rarely, barely doesn't rain. The critical rain is in the beginning of the winter, October, November, December. Anyone who learned Masechet Tanit knows very well. If it doesn't rain in Cheshvan, we go crazy in Kislev. And by the time you get to Tevet, you know, it's, it's, there's fast days and everything. Basically, the, the outcome <coughs> of the agricultural year and our, basically our sustenance in our life our drinking water and water for agriculture for animals is a function of the rains that fall this time of year in the um, November, December. If it doesn't rain, it's going to be the, the consequences it can be disastrous. Uh, that's why it's not just the rain that's going to take care of the crops now, but rather the rain that fills up the, uh, the aquifer and the, uh, our cisterns and things like that. And that's the rain, that's the water we have to drink in the summer. Now, therefore, what do we do? The critical rain comes in the winter, early winter, late fall, early winter. We plant later in the winter, early spring. Remember Tu B'Shvat? It's like the, the sort of the cutoff point between last year and planting for the upcoming year. It's not by chance we plant trees in Tu B'Shvat, which is towards the end of the winter and the end of the rainy season. There's still a month or two to go, but that's when they <coughs> take root. The rain harvest begins in mid-April to mid-June, which overlaps with Sferat Omer, as we'll see soon. But there's only two months that you can harvest grain in the land of Israel. It's quite different than the Great Plains in America. We can have two or three or even four sometimes um, um, grain uh, wheat crops a year and barley. In Israel, there's only one harvest a year. In Egypt, there's more than one because of the Nile River. It gives you uh, water all year long. And therefore, in Israel, the grain harvest is one season, April to June. And then our fruit harvest at the end of the summer, that... Um, that all its nourishment in the, in the wintertime, but now it gives its fruit in the summer. And <coughs> the dates, the figs, the grapes, the olives, the shabamini, they don't need water in the summer, but as long as they have enough water in the winter, they give their fruit in the summer. So all the social gilim relate to that cycle. Now, what are we going to see? In Vayikra today, we're going to see that all the social gilim have the number seven very central in their celebration. And what I want to suggest is because they relate to nature and the recognition that the system that we call nature, the whole system that allows us to do agriculture is from God and uses that system to reward and punish us based on our, our society. Therefore, I'm going to, when I celebrate those holidays, the number seven will be, will be very central. And we'll see that soon in Vayikra. Now, to see that in Vayikra, first I have to do a quick overview of Sefer Vayikra which is a whole, that could be a whole series. I'm assuming you've read the book before, you're familiar. I just want to give a quick overview of Vayikra and then we'll focus in on, on Parsha and more. So Vayikra has two key sections, in case you didn't notice. Part one, the first, 18, first 17 chapters. Basically, now that the Mishkan is built in Sefer Shmot, Sefer Shmot, we build the Mishkan. Sefer Vayikra, we use the Mishkan. If you want to make a nice um, differentiation between Shmot and Vayikra. Shmot finishes when the Mishkan is built and constructed. Now that we have a symbol of God's presence in our camp, in our midst, now how to use the Mishkan. So the first five chapters, the first seven chapters, basically, but basically the first five is man can come close to God. You can bring voluntary offerings. Here's what you can bring in the first three chapters called Korban Deva. And then sometimes you have to bring an offering if you unintentionally did something wrong. That's called Korban Chova or mandatory offerings. And then there's how to bring those offerings. That's Parshat Sav where there's laws for how the konim bring each type of korban, the details in Sefer Vayikra. 
after we have um, those laws about how to use the Mishkan, we sort of um, take a tangent and we go back to the story of dedicating the Mishkan. And even though the laws, the commandment to dedicate the Mishkan, or the seven days of Miluim, the seven day inaugural ceremony, or I mean, the seven day, um, we'll say that's the eight days inaugural ceremony, the seven days of getting it ready and practicing, putting it together and training the Kohanim, those seven days, the commandment was given in Parsha Tetzava. For some reason, the execution of those seven days is recorded in Tevar Vayikra. And again, it relates to the number seven and this idea of nature, as we'll see. The number seven is going to be very central in establishing the Mishkan. When we go back to Sefer Shmot, um, closer to when we study Sefer Shmot and Parsha Shabua, we're going to see how the number seven is central in the Mishkan itself. Um, and all the laws of Tuma and Tara. But for now, we just mentioned seven is central here in the seven days of Miloim, which leads into eight, which very much similar to what we saw with Hanukkah, where eight, like the eighth day after nature, then we have the eighth day of Brit Milah, with our special connection with God, with God picking the Jewish people. And then we have seven days, and then the eighth day, now begins our special relationship with God in the Mishkan. Quickly then, um, after we have how to use the Mishkan and making it functional, then we have when men cannot come close to God temporarily when you're sort of, you're not allowed to come to God or basically how you contract Tuma. Tuma meaning you're, you're, I wouldn't call it impure, but you're not allowed to come to the temple when you, when you're, when you have Tuma. So how do you become Tame and how do you get rid of your Tuma? That's chapters 11 to 7 to 15. And there's so many Tumot that deal with the number seven. Sarat, for example, Tumat Mate, which is in Bat Midbar, but um, Zab and Zava. All these natural cycles, like um, the cycle of Anida, the menstrual cycle, is again related to the number seven and counting seven days and seven days of Tara for Tzarat, all, all these different things. The whole process of returning to God, again, centers around the number seven. We're not going to do that today, even though it's in Baikra, because first we have to go back and see it in back in Sefer Shmot when we built the Mishkan. Uh, and then the, um, you know, the ultimate is when you you know, in general, you can never go to the Kodesh Kodesh in the Holy of Holies, except in Yom Kippur. So the topic of Yom Kippur is there. And chapter 17 has to do with respecting the temple, but not our topic today. That's part one, again, about how and when to use the Mishkan. Now that God's presence is felt, is uh, symbolized or felt in the center of our camp, instead of God being in a cage and God's only in the center of the Mishkan and in the, in the Mikdash, the whole idea of a Mishkan at the center of our camp is that for to emanate to our day-to-day -day life in the camp. In other words, we have a Mishkan at the center. God makes that special, that area special. Kedushat Makom, what's called. And the purpose of Kedushat in the center of the camp is for it to emanate outside and have an effect on our lives and our day-to-day -day life, either in the camp of Israel in the desert or in the land of Israel, once we come to the land of Israel. And then we have Kedushat in three realms. Kedushat in the realm of man. Therefore, we have how humans, how we have to behave with God has a relationship with all humans, but he separated one people to serve him, to represent him. That's Kedushim to you, because you know, you're know Kadosh. Therefore, you have to act special. That's the laws in chapter 19. But there's also how you shouldn't behave. But based in chapters 18, 19, and 20, with 19 at the center, is how you should behave. And of course, how you shouldn't behave. That was chapters 18 and 20. Laws uh, primarily about, um, <coughs> about improper relationships and things like that. And then, just like there's special laws for an Am Kadosh, there's special laws for a nation representing God, there's special laws for the Kohanim. There's, Am Yisrael is a Mamlechet Kohanim representing God to other nations. They have special laws in chapters 18 to 20. There's special laws for the Kohanim themselves who represent God or serve God for Am Yisrael themselves. And then, basically, this whole section becomes Dushan, the realm of man. And, <coughs> and because you're representing God, God, you're held to a higher standard. We have special laws. Then we have to stand the realm of time, which is our topic today, the Moadim. And then we have to stand the realm of space, which is going to be Shemitah and the land of Israel. So I just want to give this, and then there's an epilogue at the end about man offering himself. Okay, if we have time, we give a whole shiran Baikra. But I only want to focus today on chapter 23. So I did that quick overview of Sefer Baikra, just to get our feet wet in the book. But I want to talk about the centrality of the number seven in the realm of Tusha, the realm of time, or what we call the Moadim. Um, of course, the biggest topic will be Tusha, the realm of space, with the laws of Shemitah in chapter 25 and 26. But as a first step today, 
I want to begin with Dusha in the realm of time, because we need that first to appreciate what's going to be Dusha in the realm of space. Okay, so that's our background. And now we're going to take a look at chapter 23. <coughs> okay. Now, <coughs> this is the reason why I gave the introduction from um, Parshat Mishpatim, where we have the pilgrimage holidays, very basic, very general, the three times of year are the critical times of the agricultural cycle, in the beginning of the spring, when grain begins to grow. And at the end of your grain harvest, in the beginning of your fruit harvest, Shavuot, or Chag Katsir, and the end of your fruit harvest, Chag Asif, which is the beginning of next year's rainy season, uh, those critical times of the year, God wants you to be seen. You go visit God to remember the, those values. Uh, that was the short version. In Parshat Emor, we're going to get a detailed set of laws about how we celebrate the holidays. So that, that was the connection between what we saw in Sefer Shemot, chapter 23, the Vaykor chapter 23, just by chance, they're both chapter 23, but it's, I think that's by chance because the chapter division is not Jewish. Now, uh, later, we'll, if we have time, we'll, connect, we'll, click the, we'll check the connection to chapter 24 and uh, lighting the menorah. Now, what's special about Parsha and more, it's the first time we have the holidays with the lunar calendar because we have the Shosh Galim. We had them the first time in Parsha Mishpatim, but we had no dates. We just said a spring holiday coinciding with the date we leave Egypt. But the Chag Katsir and Chag Asif were agricultural dates, agricultural times of year, with no specific dates. Now in Parshat Emor, we're going to have a lunar calendar. In fact, we're going to have a sort of a blending between the lunar calendar and the solar calendar. Now, the name of the holidays we'll see are called Moadim, or set times, times to meet. Uh, and we have to see all the holidays have something in common, but each one has something special. And when we talk about what's special about each holiday, we have to look at the number seven. So let's begin now with Laikra Perach of Gimel. And first we're going to read it from the Tanakh. And then we're going to, after we read it from the Tanakh, we're going to take it inside. And there's our sources over there. Okay, so let's get to work. Um, share our screen and we open up Chomesh, but let's use an English Hebrew one, right? English Hebrew, Leviticus, better known as Vayikra, chapter 23. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about the structure of the unit minute. I just want to look at the opening lines. Now the word Moed, the shortest of the word Moed is Vad, Vav Ayin Dalad, which means to meet. But whenever you meet someone, you have to set a time. So these are times that we meet God. For example, the Ova Moed is a tent of meeting. Again, the word Vad is to meet, like a Vad, a Vada Kashrut, or a Vida is a conference. Um, so a Moed is a set time to meet, and there are times that we meet God. We talked about that back in Parshat Mishpatim, and now we're going to get details of how we do it. Now, what's special about them? Because now we're introducing this in the lunar calendar. Asher Tikru Kodesh Unlike Shabbat, where once we began keeping Shabbat, <coughs> remember in, um, with the story of the man, the first Shabbat was the 22nd day of ER, second, 22nd day of the second month when we left Egypt, um, <coughs> in the story of the man. Ever since then, last four, four or 5,000 years, we've been keeping Shabbat every, every seven days. It has nothing to do with the moon, with, with, any, with history, it's just every seven days, it's Shabbat. It's a rather amazing we've kept that for a long time and haven't missed one. Now, unlike that, the holidays, the Moadim, are set times. We decide when they are. How do we decide? Because we decide when Rosh Chodesh is. Now, we don't have too much of uh, you know, room to make decisions because we have to do it with the new moon. And either the month can be 29 or 30 days. So we have room on our calendar to play with it a little bit. But we still decide when Rosh Chodesh is. And therefore, the holidays are built on the lunar calendar we basically go out and decide um, when they're celebrated. Now, but the name Mikra Kodesh, I want to talk about, the, Mikra means to call out. I'll give you an example. Um, see the word Mikra? The crow is to call someone. So if I go quickly and take a look in Sefer Bamidbar, in Sefer Bamidbar, where are we? Where's my home? Should we go? In Sefer Bamidbar, chapter 10. Just I want to show you the word Mikra to understand the simple meaning of the word. 
God tells Moshe, make two trumpets. That's for calling out to the camp. What's that mean? If you blow one, one tkia, who gathers together? See a moed gathering together? They meet, um, the entire Eidah meets in front of the camp. Um, if you only blow one tkia, only the leaders come. But if you do a trua, then it's time to travel. But basically, the mikra Eidah, if you want to have an assembly, when you want people to assemble together, you call out for them together. So mikra is a time to call out to the people together. And the goal of Yom Tov is basically for people to gather together. That's why we go to Shul. But the main idea of Mikra Kodesh is a time we call out. We have basically a national or at least a community gathering. And then we talk about the themes of our, of our, um, um, okay, what's that? Take the question from Jennifer. What's special about the lunar versus solar calendar? Okay, we'll talk about exactly the, um, the, the, how we bring the two calendars together. We'll see very soon. So again, I just brought the Psukim in Sefer Bamidbar simply to point out what the word Mikra means. Let's go back to Vayikra Chav Gimel. So God says, Mikra Kodesh, these are Moadim, these are the set times. And then we have almost a contradiction because I said, what's special about Mikra Kodesh? We decide when they start. It's a national gathering. Then we say, every six days you keep Shabbat. So, I mean, sorry, every six days you work and every seventh day you keep Shabbat. And you can't do any work on those days. Now, at first, it sounds like a contradiction. But then when you keep on reading, you see, Ela Mode Hashem, these are the Moadim. So basically, this section is parenthetical. And then, then we have the lunar calendar. The first month, on the 14th day of the month, is Pesach. We bring Korban Pesach. On the 15th of the month, is Chag HaMatzot. And then we have the first day. And then for our topic today, um, what do we do? Shivat Yamin. Seven days we keep Chag Matzot. On the first day and seventh day, we have a special gathering, Yikra Kodesh. Now, why is Chag Matzot seven days? There's no obvious reason in Chumash. Even when we came out of Egypt, God said keep it for seven days. And way before we left Egypt, way before there was you know, splitting in the sea or anything, because it's Chag Aviv, it's a spring holiday, it has to be seven days. Because again, it relates to nature and the cycle of nature, the rhythm of nature that begins in the spring, we want to make sure to remember that God is behind all the powers of nature, and therefore, it's going to be seven. Now, I'm going to go back to this opener and share with you something. Now we can go to our regular source sheet. Now that our homage is over, let's take a look. What do we have? I formatted it this way. That tells Moshe, tell B'nai Israel, these are the Moadim that you have to call. In parentheses, you work six days a week, and the seventh day you rest in parentheses, and then these are the Moadim. Now, for what reason, why am I making Shabbat a parenthetical introduction? Now, you talk about this every Shabbat when you make Kiddush. I'm not sure if you're aware, but these are the Elam Moadei Hashem Mikrei Kodesh. These are the set times that we have holidays. Now, if you ask anybody, what's more important, Shabbat or Yom Tov? Most people will say, you know, Yom Tov always seems to be more important. More, pe more people come to Shul on Yom Tov than Shabbos. But when we make Kiddush every night, I mean, every Friday night, what are we saying? When we make Kiddush every Friday night, first we thank, um, we, we welcome our hosts. Remember Shabbat Hamaka? We welcome Shabbat. And we thank God who invited, who brought that host. And then we pray Shabbat with three different praises. Remember what we say? What's special about Shabbat? We say, we thank God who you know gave us mitzvot. The Shabbat Kotsho, He gave us Shabbat. He gives us Baava. And what's special about Shabbat? There's three praises. Remember them. Shabbat is zechel maseh breshit, isn't it? When we keep Shabbat, it reminds us of creation. That's the Ten Commandments in, in Sefer Shemot. It's zechel the Tzet Mitzrayim. That's the Ten Commandments in Sefer Dvarim. And what else do we say in between? It's tchilah the Mikrei Kodesh. Remember, I'm like that in 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 Kiddush. Ralph, we all know it by heart. What are we referring to? What's the Bob Shat? Shabbat is Tchilad Mikrei Kodesh. That's exactly these lines in Sefer by Yikra. You follow? One praise is from Shmot, the Ten Commandments. One praise is from the Barim, the Ten Commandments. The middle one is from Vayikra. In fact, it goes in order. Shmot, Vayikra, the Barim. Now, we're praising Shabbat. We're making a toast to Shabbat. We're welcoming Shabbat. 
And therefore, we're saying how great Shabbat is. Shabbat reminds us of creation. It reminds us of the purpose of the Exodus. But in the middle, it, it's also, it's before it introduces the holidays. What we're going to see, it overrides the holidays. Shabbat is more important than Yom Tov. We know that because the laws of Shabbat override Yom Tov. It's, it's, we know we're allowed to cook on Yom Tov. What might somebody think? Somebody might think that if Yom Tov is more important and it's okay to cook on Yom Tov, maybe Yom Tov overrides Shabbat. And if Shabbat and Yom Tov come out in the same day, maybe it would be okay to cook. So before I have the laws of Yom Tov, I'm just explaining in Ramban. Before we have the laws of Yom Tov, let's look at our screen again. What happens? Let's take a look again. What does God say? Um, coming up are the Moadim of Hashem. Before we start the Moadim, um, we talk about Shabbat. And Shabbat, you can't do any work. We'll see, kol as opposed to malachat avodah, we'll see soon. You can't do any work. And now these are the Moadim, the first month, 14th day, 15th, and we'll see the lunar calendar. So the way the Ramban explains this is that um, this is coming to tell you that Shabbat overrides Yom Tov, even though you might think otherwise. And but we, we talk about in Kiddush that it's Chilad Mikrei Kodesh, the introduction to Mikrei Kodesh is Shabbat. Now, I want to suggest an additional reason. Because the number, the, all the, almost all the Mikrei Kodesh all revolve around the number seven, the seven days of Chag HaMatzot, we'll see the seven days of Chag HaSukot, the seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. So in fact, Shavuot is called weeks. So Chag HaMatzot is seven days. The first day and seventh day are special. Then we have seven weeks to Chag HaKatsir, Chag Shavuot, and we call it weeks. So number seven is central in that holiday. Then we have Chag HaSif, which is Sukkot, which is seven days. We have, we have the special days of seven days of, of the Sukkah. And then in the seventh month, we have all the, what's called the Rosh Hashanah and Kippur holidays. So the number seven is key in all the holidays in all these Moadim. So this is only telling you that Shabbat is more important. It, it's coming to explain to you why the number seven is so central in the Moadim. Because it all goes back to creation. For the same reason, we have to remember that God created everything. Once a week, we have to remember when we celebrate our agricultural holidays. In, in our, it's just like in our day-to-day -day lives, we have to remember seven. In our yearly, in our, in our economic calendar, in our fiscal year, we have to remember God behind our economy as well. And hence, the number seven is key in all the holidays. So what I want to suggest is this little introduction of Sheish Yamim, it's not just that Shabbat overrides Yom Tov, but it's more than that. It's going to be the background to why all the holidays revolve around the number seven. Now, I, I want to bring an example of, um, of this idea that Shabbat overrides, um, Shabbat can override other laws. Because this format in, in Baikra Perach of Gimel, it's just like the beginning of um, Parshat Vayakel. If I go back again to Sefer Shemot, Bible, Exodus, chapter 25. Here we are. Chapter 25, chapter 35. Make a mistake. Parshat Vayakel. Remember how it begins? Moshe, Moshe gathers together all the congregation and tells them, Eila hadvarim asher tziva Hashem lasotetam. Here's what God commanded to do. It's clearly referring to the Mishkan. Everyone knows the, if you know the Gemara in seventh Parak and Shabbat, Eila Dvarim, that's how we learned. Eila um, uh, is 36 in Gematria, and Dvarim is at least two, and He is three. So that's how we learned 39 Malachot. That's a beautiful drash. But Pshad of the Pasuk, Eila Dvarim is not referring to Shabbat and what you can't do, because Eila Asher Tzibah Shem Lasototam. And it's talking about, when Moshe says in a minute, Okay, make basically all the parts of the Mishkan. And um, what's it say? Uh, and basically, it's everything today. Everything is Vasita, Vasita, Vasita. The whole Mishkan is, um, is doing. Uh, where is the word I need? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's perfect. Got it? All wise men. With a wise heart, I'm sorry. Um, all capable people should come and do. So from Pasuk Aleph, I need to go right to Pasuk Gimel. Got it? Moshe gathers, here's what God wants you to do. And God tells Moshe, um, Moshe tells the people, here's and here's what you need to do. Here are the materials and do it. Before we talk about what you need to do, what is parenthetically saying? Even though we're building a house for God, 
Remember, you can only work on the Mishkan six days a week, but Shabbat overrides building the Mishkan. What did we learn from here? That construction of the Mishkan is not Doche Shabbat. And therefore, you're allowed to work on the Mishkan six days a week, even though you're doing God's work, not your work. You can't do construction of the Mishkan on Shabbat. So it's just like, see the same idea? I introduce a topic, parenthetically Shabbat, to tell me um, Shabbat overrides um, construction of the Mishkan, even though you're working for God. And then we have the laws of the Mishkan. But just like uh, by the Moadim, the number seven is going to be central when we actually build the Mishkan, when we get to the seven days of Miluim, the seven branches of the Menorah. There'll be a technical reason, but a much deeper reason when we do that in detail. Okay, let's check the chat real fast, then we'll get back to work. Um, it's seven second. At the end of Pasuk 2, it says, um, yeah, We'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to Pasuk Bet in a minute. So if seven is so important, um, we have a fixed calendar. No doubt about the holiday Chag should be in diaspora. Wait, good community. No doubts about when the holiday Chag shouldn't be in diaspora also. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure. I better get back to your question at the end of the class. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay. Let's continue now in, oh, our main source sheet. Here we go. So I was trying to show you that these are the Moadim. We work six days a week and we reintroduce the Moadim. Someone asked, why do we have, uh, no, Asher, no, about them. This introduction is taking me right to, let me annotate here to highlight this. Now that I got all these nice tools. Here. is This is parenthetical. That was your question, right? We have to call them out. These are Moadim. Pasigimo is parenthetical. And I pick up where I left off. So Shabbat is not a Moed. It can't be Moed because we don't call it out. Shabbat is, is, a, is going to be, we'll see, it'll be called a Shabbaton. It's a time of rest, but the Moadim, Shabbat is not a Moed. No, it's a Mikra Kodesh. It's time we gather together. Shabbat is a Mikra Kodesh, right? Yom Shri Shabbat, Mikra Kodesh. We gather together in Shabbat and study Torah, but it's not a Moed. So now let's continue and clear my drawings. Okay, now notice the calendar now. Now, how does the lunar calendar match the solar calendar? Everyone knows that if the first month has to be in the spring. Remember Shmort Chodesh Aviv? And if 12 months passed and we didn't reach the spring equinox, we had a month that's called Ibor Hashanah. Now, all the holidays in Parsha, in Baikra, in, in Baikra Chav Gimel, in, in Parsha Damur, have something they all share in common and something special about each one. First of all, they all have, almost all of them have lunar dates. We'll talk about uh, Shavuot in a minute. But the first holiday is going to be First holiday is Tapka Pesach, which is almost parenthetical. But the main holiday on the 15th of the month is Chag Matzot. And what do we do? Eat matzah for seven days. What do we do on the first day? Number one, there's three things. It's a Mikra Kodesh, Yelachem. It's a time of gathering. You can't do Melechet Avodah. You can't do work. We'll talk about what defines work here in a minute. And you bring a Korban to God. What we're going to find in all the holidays, we have all three phrases. It's Mikra Kodesh. The Moadim are times to gather, to time set aside to gather, to talk about the theme of the holiday, have the national community gathering. We don't do any work, and we bring a korban to God. Let's work backwards. Vikrafti Mishad Lashem, if you click on this in a, uh, with a hypertext, this would take you right to Parshat Pinchas. What, what is the korban that the nation brings on the holidays? The details you'll find in Parshat Pinchas and Sefer Bamidbar. That's a two parim and one, one ayo, seven klasim, uh, sir lachatat. That's all we know by heart from chapters 28 and 29 in Sefer Bamidbar. Why those laws are Bamidbar, not by Ikram, separate topic, but not for now. But there's no doubt the Ikraf Mishael Hashem is referring to the laws in Sefer Bamidbar. The Pesukim are explicit. Now, let's go back to Kol Melechat Avodah. Shabbat, we said, was Kol Melecha. No work can be done. On Shabbat, on, on holidays, again, I'm going to follow Ramban. Ramban says, he calls this Melchash um, Vasadot, work in the field, but I want to call, I want to call this a bank holiday. Meaning, on Shabbat, when we don't work, when we refrain from work on Shabbat, that creates Shabbat. Like when we do Shvitat Malacha, when we hold back from doing any work, we stop all creativity on Shabbat, remember that God gave us creativity. So by holding back from creativity on Shabbat, 
that creates the atmosphere of Shabbat, that makes Shabbat. And, and not working on Shabbat is the essence of Shabbat. On Yom Tov, not working enables Shabbat. And basically the banks are closed or the marketplace is closed. If you live in the Teaneck area, or Brigham County is called Blue, they're called Blue Laws, where shopping malls have to be closed, not just banks, but all commerce is closed down, except for necessities. And therefore, in order for people to gather, if it's a work day, if the marketplace is open, it wouldn't be Mikra Kodesh. So whenever you have the word Mikra Kodesh, it's always followed by Kol Melechat Abodah. What I'm trying to explain is that there's a linkage between a time of gathering, we call it people to gather, and the bank holiday, you can't do any work in the field. Basically, your commerce is closed down for the day, what they call in, um, what they call in English a bank holiday. Banks are closed, the marketplace is closed, no work is done. And that enables people to gather because if, if businesses were open, people would be running their businesses. In order to enable people to gather and talk about the theme of Yom Tov, the marketplace has to be closed. So it's not holding back from work, creating the atmosphere of Shabbat, like what happens on Shabbat, but rather holding back from work enables. Does it create Yom Tov? It enables Yom Tov. Yom Tov will be gathering together and talking about what the theme of the holiday is. And those days we bring special korbanot. We'll talk about later. Now, what's the first holiday? For seven days, we eat matzah, right? On the last day, on the seventh day, we have a special, um, we have a holiday in Mikro Kodesh on the first day and the seventh day. Again, why seven days? Because it's the Aviv, it's the spring. And because it's the spring, and it relates to the beginning of nature and the cycles of nature, that continues. Now, what's really interesting when you look at Parsha Damor, in fact, let me give you, I'll show you this in a minute, but let me show you in a, in a, regular, in a regular Hebrew Tanakh. Let me open this up. Um, where are we? We have a, oh, I had one before. I'll use this one. We want this, we want, no, we don't want this one, we want this one. I thought it was open, but it's not. Okay, in Sefer Baikra, Tanach, Baikra, Chav Gimel. And we'll do a gear sound for a second. There we go. Remember, these are the partial, which help us identify units. So we have the introduction with the parenthetical Shabbat over here. Then we have Pekeh Be'at Elam Hashem, and we have the laws of Chag Matzot. Now, really, this is all, we, almost all these laws we had beforehand in Parshat Bo by themselves. Now we have it in the framework of the Shosh Trugalim. Now, what I want to claim is this next sec, there's next two parshiot from Pasik Tet to Chabet. This is going to be an insert because there's no, there's no lunar date for Shavuot. So we're going to skip this in a minute. I want to pick up from Pasach of Gimel. How does Rosh Hashanah begin? By Dabar Shem Hashanah Mor, Dabar Ben Yisrael, B'chodesh Hashvi, Bechad Chodesh Yelchem Shabbaton, Zichron Tov Mikra Kodesh. On the first day of the seventh month, a special gathering. You can't do any work. And be crafted by Hashem. Again, all three things. You know, was, what's common between Rosh, what we call Rosh Hashanah, what Chumash calls um, Zichron Torah? What's special about this holiday? It's a Mikra Kodesh, like all of them. Mikra Kodesh is all of them. And therefore, Komalach, you can't do work. And you bring a special Korban. What's special? It's Zichron Torah. What that means, it's a time, do we have to remember to blow shofar? Do we blow shofar to remember? It's real simple. We blow shofar to remember that God's judging us based on our deeds. Now, why is there a holiday in the seventh month? The, of course, the number seven itself is important. It's the seventh month. But also, the seventh month is a month before the rainy season. And if the rainy season is going to determine an agricultural year, an agricultural economy in the land of Israel, who's going to live and who's going to die is going to be determined by the rainfall. A month before the rainfall begins, we have to declare that our rainfall is in the hands of God, and God gives us rain based on our deeds. That's what we say every day in Shema. Remember, if you don't listen, and therefore we need to remember that and internalize that, and we spend a whole month of remembering that God's in charge of our of nature, and he judges us based on our deeds. Therefore, it's a day of judgment, then we have to ask for forgiveness. We have uh, the Dean of, of Yom Kippur, but the reason why this time of year, the reason why it's the beginning of the year and we're being judged, because even though it appears there's no nature's judging us, 
we're going a month before nature judges us and saying God is behind nature, and hence the seventh month will be dedicated to all these holidays. Um, then we have the, but the, the week in between, and then we have Yom Kippur. Now, then we get to Sukkot. What happens? God tells Moshe, on the 15th day, again, a lunar day, in the seventh month, Why seven days? The only logical reason for seven days is because it's an agricultural holiday. And therefore, on the first day, we make a Mikha Kodesh. And then seven days, we bring a special Korban to God. And the eighth day, we something special that's going to go back. We'll appreciate that much better when we do the seven days of Miluim and Yom Ashwini. You can't miss the parallel between Yom Ashwini of dedicating the Mishkan and Yom Ashwini of Shmini Atzeret after the seven days, after the cycles of seven, the eighth. Remember, the seven days of Sukkot will be more universal, and the eighth day will be special for Am Yisrael. Uh, why we summarize the Maudim here, we'll talk about later. And then we go back and they have more laws of Sukkot, even on the 15th day of the month, when we gather our produce, we have again a holiday of seven days. The first day is Shabbaton, the last day of Shabbaton. And then we take things from nature that deal with water. Remember the Prey Sadar, Kapot Barim, Anafi Sabot, Nachal. And we have a holiday again for how many? For seven days. With the symbols from nature. We call the Arba Mini, the four species. Again, we take this Chad Lashem Shibat Yamim. So you have the seventh month, seven days. Hope my point's clear. The number seven is the star of chapter um, of chapter 23. Why? There's no doubt the overall topic of chapter 23 is nature. It's going to be the again the spring holiday, the grain harvest, the fruit harvest, and the seventh month will be looking forward to the upcoming uh, rainy season, which is the beginning of the next agricultural year. And then, um, so everything has to do with nature, and therefore everything revolves around the number seven, and the understanding that this what we call nature, which appears to have many powers, is really one power, all from God, and God's going to use that. Now we have to thank God for making nature. We have to recognize why he gave us the ability to have this commerce, to have an agriculture, what we do with it, and remember that God judges us based on our deeds. Now, I want to go now and focus on this insert here. What does God say? Um, let's read the beginning of, of what we call Shavuot and pay careful attention. Remember, all the Moadim have a have a lunar date. Let me go back and do a different year here real fast. Um, let me show you. I have this highlighted this way. This was the last line of, of Chag HaMatzot. I've got this insert from Pasuk Tet to Chabet of what we call Shavuot. And then we pick up again with on the seventh month on the first day. But I want to show you, for some reason, there's no lunar date for Shavuot. But there's a good reason why there's no lunar date, because it has nothing to do with the moon. Let me explain why. Was, what I want to say is this, this unit from Pasuk Tet to Chabet could be anywhere in Chumash. It's inserted, Chumash inserts it in the middle of the Moadim. And that's why I need a new Dibor when it's over. And that's why there's a Dibor in the beginning. But there's a Dibor in the very beginning, introducing the holidays. Everything should be within that Dibor. But for some reason, I have an answer. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, if I go back to Sefer Bamidbar and look at the Mikrei Kodesh, the, with the Vikrafta Me, the Shad Hashem, if I go to Sefer Bamidbar, chapter 28, you can double check it later on your own. You open up chapter 28, what happens? By Daber Hashem and Moshe Demor, God speaks to Moshe saying, Sabah Bisar Bamatalehem, a Kobari Lachmi, and then first the daily Korban, followed by Shabbat, a double thing, and on Rosh Chodesh, a special Korban. Let me do the special Korban on Rosh Chodesh. There's a Dibur in the very beginning, followed by the, the daily calendar, Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, and then what we call Chagam uh, Matzot, Yom Abikurim, and we continue into Perachav Tet. Um, the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the seven days of Chag of, of Chaga, of Chaga Sukkot, and Shemini Yatzeret. It's all one Dibur. God, it says, I'm sorry, what to say at the end? That's, that's what you do on these, on the Mo'adechem. That's the link to Mo'adei Hashem. These are, whatever it says, it's referring to this. But 
God started speaking in Perak Havchet, and hasn't, there's no new Dibor. It's all one Dibor until the beginning of Perak Lamed. What does Moshe do? The chapter division is wrong here. This should be the last line of chapter 29. God told Moshe, when God finishes commanding Moshe, Moshe tells Ben Esau everything that God commanded him. And that's the end of the Parshia. You follow? Therefore, all the holidays, one Dibor. In the Moadim in Amor, when I go back to Parshat Amor, let's go back here to Baikra. When I go back here to Amor, what do I find? There's one Dibur in the beginning that takes me up until, up until, sorry. There's one Dibur in the beginning. Dibur here that takes me with the header and Chagamatzot. I have a new Dibur that introduces counting the Omer in seven weeks. And I have another Dibor when I go back and pick up with Rosh Hashanah. And then again, a special one for Yom Kippur and Sukkot. But instead of all the Moadim being in one Dibor, this, this one inserted Dibor that doesn't have a lunar date. And I want to show you, this could be anywhere, this could stand alone. So we're going to read it now together and see how it stands alone. Let's um, open up an English Hebrew Tanakh here, Leviticus 23, verse 9. Let's take a quick look, make it bigger, and move your pictures up here. Okay. By that Basha Moshe the more. The Bell Bene Sava Matavahim, Kitabol Aretz, when you come to land, which I'm giving you, Uksatemik Sira, when you begin your grain harvest, which is sometime in the spring, there's no exact date because it depends on, on the season. It could be end of March, early April. But when you when the grain harvest is begin, when the grain begins to become harvestable. What do you do? The very first sheaves of barley, because barley comes out before wheat. The very first sheaves of barley that you begin to harvest, you take your very first one, the first sheaf of barley, and you wave it, and you call it Omer, without going to the white, it's called Omer now. We wave it in front of God. When? Mimokrat HaShabbat. Totally ambiguous what that means, Mimokrat HaShabbat. What Shabbat is that referring to? But it's not Shabbat of Cholomoy. This stands alone has nothing to do now with Chag HaMatzot. Because when do you do this? You, when you come in the land, and you what? And you bring in your harvest. Whenever you begin your harvest, you bring this Korban after the first Shabbat. Now, why is Shabbat? What's Shabbat have to do with waving the Omer? And waving, because it's a holiday that relates to agriculture and nature. Of course it relates to Shabbat. Our very first Shabbat, remember the, we did the show way back about Omer. Omer goes back to the mana. Remember, the, uh, the Omer was the measure that we used to collect the, um, we measured and collected our, our mana in the desert. And in the desert, our food was from God. It's like in the land of Israel. Uh, we gathered ourselves our grain and we're going to treat our grain as though it's mana from God. Therefore, we call it Omer. And to make that statement, we talk about Omer for all the seven weeks of the, of the grain harvest season. But during that season, Everything revolves around the number seven because the first Shabbat experience was with the mana and the Omer. And therefore, don't be surprised that we're going to count weeks and not just days. And don't be surprised we wave it in Melchata Shabbat, whatever Shabbat referring to here. Now, but it's unclear what Shabbat we're talking about, but there's no ne necessary linkage between Chagamatzot and the Omer, other than the fact that Chagamatzot has to be in the Aviv in the spring. And then what do we do? When we bring the Omer, you bring a special korban with it, and then you don't need anything from the new fruit, from the new um, grain, until you bring this korban. That's called chadash. Now, then, after you bring the korban, it becomes yashan. And then we count for seven weeks, which happens to be the seven weeks of the grain harvest, seven weeks, seven Shabbatot. Again, because of agriculture, the number seven is the star here, an idea of a week. And then when it's all done, we bring a special korban, and then on the day when the seven weeks are over, on the 50th day, you have a Mikra Kodesh again. You can't do any work. And we have the special Korban we brought before, and we don't do work. Now, out of place here, but this is the whole thing we talked about from the beginning. After we bring this, after the seven weeks of our grain harvest, what do you have to remember? When we do our grain harvest, don't take everything for yourself, remember? Leave over, like it, Shechan, Peah, leave over for the poor people. Like what we got rid is about leaving for the poor, the needy, the stranger, the widow, because they don't own land. And the way you thank God is not by saying thank you, but acting thank you. And therefore, we're going to repeat a law, a law right out of Parshat Doshim to you. We're going to repeat it here as a reminder 
that you're not just waving the omer so God gives you a grain harvest, but you're waving the omer to remember to be worthy of a good grain harvest. You have to be like Boaz, and when you bring in your harvest, you have to be thoughtful of those who are less fortunate. Now, what I want to go back to now is my little drawing here from before and try to make my point. Because the laws of Omer, which could stand alone, they're not part of a lunar calendar. There's, there can't be a lunar date for Shavuot because it depends on when Rosh Chodesh comes out that month, but it's 50 days later. You can't have a date on the third month, on the sixth day, to celebrate Shavuot. By definition, it's impossible because you don't know what day Rosh Chodesh is going to come out. You have Rosh Chodesh Iyan, Rosh Chodesh Sivan in between. But Shavuot is 50 days later when you start counting. But these laws are inserted. What does Chumash do? Chumash inserted this into Perach of Gimel. Because Chumash inserts the laws of Omer in the Moadim, what does Chazal learn from there? God wants us to link the Omer with the Moadim. And therefore, when do we start waving the Omer? We, take, we say Shabbat is going to be the Shabbat of the first day of Pesach. Because on the first day of, of, of Chag Amsot, first day of Chag Amsot, because the first day of Chag Amsot is a day that you don't do any work, I can refer to it as Shabbat, but Chumash is leaving that up to the rabbis to decide. Chumash isn't telling you what day to start counting, but the rabbis take a hint from Chumash because Chumash inserts the laws of Sefirat Omer In the middle of the Moadim, it has to be linked to the Moadim. And therefore, Chazal decided that Shabbat must be referring to the first day of Yom Tov, which is totally, perfectly logical. And that's our minute. Of course, the Tzduchim disagreed, and they, tap, you know, they do Shabbat Chalamon. I'm saying the, the rabbinic interpretation that Shabbat is referring to the first day of Yonto is just as legitimate as any interpretation because there's no shot of Chumash what day to bring it on. Chumash is leaving that up to, the, up to, up to Am Yisrael. But the hint that God gave us is by inserting this laws of Omer, which could stand alone, and inserting it within the Moadim. But by definition, you can't count seven weeks from your grain harvest and have an exact lunar date because it's not dependent on the lunar date. But, it's, but it makes sense, though, to, to link it to the first day of Yom Tov HaGamatzot, and that's exactly what we do. And in fact, the, uh, the 16th of the month was, it, was the day we start counting, which goes back to the story of the mana, uh, which began falling on the 16th of the month. So that's what I want to share with you on... Um, let's go back to our, our other source sheet. What happened to it? Um, I'm missing something. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. Let's go back up here. What do we have? We have, oh, God, time's up. Um, so again, the holidays and the more, they follow the agricultural calendar. It's the first time we have the holidays with the lunar calendar. Each holiday shares those three ideas, but something special. What's ever special about it somehow relates to number seven in agriculture, be it the seasons, the spring, again, the grain, the beginning, end of the grain season, the fruit harvest, and the beginning of the rainy season. And everything revolves around the number seven. And just to put the highlight on the agricultural cycle, if I, I'm going to share with looking at a Chumash again. I'll share my screen and we go back to Tanakh and let's look at Vayikra Chav Gimel. When Vayikra Chav Gimel is over and the holidays are over, look what the topic in Perach Chav Dalad is. Perach Chav Dalad, which beginning, at first it sounds like it's unrelated. We, we have the mitzvah of, in Perach Chav Dalad, we have the mitzvah of, um, um, again, the seven that relates to seven for sure as well. But the menorah is the Shem and Zayt. If you know the, the calendar in the land of Israel, the agricultural calendar, the last of the seven species of Zaytim, and Zaytim, the, the olive harvest continues even past Sukkot. In fact, it goes to Hanukkah time. That's a mission in Bikurim. But the last of the seven meaning that we collect will be olives and the, you know, the grapes. The fix of the dates by, by circus time, they're all finished. That harvest is over and we're making already wine and grapes and things like, and raisins and things like that. But the very end of our harvest is, is um, olives. So it makes sense that when the agriculture calendar is over, I go right to olives and lighting the menorah. There'll be a deeper reason. But for now, I just want to point that out real quickly that the beginning of Perach of Dalad breaks the Perach of Gimel in a very nice way. Um, now, <clears throat> I didn't want to go too much into the Structure by Ikra, there's you know it's why we have the why the Makalel here, that's a whole different story. We'll stop our share and I'll answer now questions. But again, just to summarize, I try to show you that um by Ikra is not only how to use the Mishkan, but the effect of the Mishkan on the on the camp. 
and our holidays are to remember because our commerce is all built around agriculture, because Chumash is talking about an agricultural society, our fiscal year, the rhythm of that year is based on nature and the seasons of the year. And therefore, in the critical times of the seasons, we, we gather together to remember the laws of the Torah and to remember not only the guys in charge of agriculture, but he judges us based on our deeds. And therefore, we have to gather together and learn his laws you know, and teach the laws over and over again and emphasize that. Um, and that explains why the number seven is so central in the Moadim in Perak Gimel and why Chag is seven days and why Sukkot is seven days and why we have seven weeks in between and, and why the seventh month is so important. So I think that fits our title of number seven in Sefer Devarim. Let's take a look at the questions I met. I'll work backwards. Okay, okay, that's a thank you. And here, Marty. If the Chabad and Rosh Hashanah is so central to the cycle of seven, why isn't it called Yom Adin in Chumash? Oh, it is sort of, I'll explain that in a minute. Indeed, it's surprised to see that Rabbi Sachs claims that the idea of Rosh Hashanah is the judgment day. It's a later development. Okay. When you say the word Zichron Teruah, Again, that, this is a share. The question you're asking is actually a whole long share on Rosh Hashanah. But basically, um, in Dvarim, in, in Vayikra, it's called Zichron Torah. What do we do? It's the, it's, it's the beginning of the seventh month, but it's the beginning of the rainy season. Because the rainy season begins that time of year, you know, in, in, the, in the fall. And God looks over our land, remember, from the beginning of the rainy season to the end. God's in charge of the rain. But Zichron Torah, the word Zichron, if you go back to Sefer Bamidbar, uh, Perak Yud, a, when, whenever there's war, what do we do? We blow shofar, we have yom shura, we blow a shura to remember that God's judging us. Let me give you the quick example. Um, again, this is really a long share. I'll just give a really short version of it. If I go again to my Midbar Perak Yud, where we were before, this is the idea that a yom shura and zikaron go hand in hand. So should there be war, Kitav, should there be war in your land? Whoever the enemy might be, okay, we're supposed to make a, a trua sound with the, with the trumpets. But these kartem if if war is about to break out and imminent, the assumption is God's bringing war as a wake up call uh, for us to do trua. That's it's explicit in Shlomo's prayer when he dedicates the mikdash. So the assumption that if war is imminent and we're about to be attacked by an enemy, that's a sign from God that He's not happy with our behavior. We need to gather together to remember, to ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? And to do repentance. And if we do that, God promises, if we do proper tshuva, he'll, he'll come and save us. And therefore, what do we do? We don't blow shofar to wake God up. We wake shofar, right? Then we blow the chatzot, we blow the trumpets to wake ourselves up, to remember that God judges us based on our deeds, and then he'll save us from our enemies. So just like God can use war as a tool, as a wake-up tool for our bad behavior, so that we do tshuva, God can use agriculture the same way. And therefore, when the agricultural year begins, a day of the zikron tshuva, when we treat it as a war is breaking out, it's when you blow a shofar, and a shofar is a sign, it's like a reminder of war about to break out. So a zikron tshuva means to remember that you're being judged by God, even though it appears to be agriculture, God's behind it. Just like here, even though it appears to be a foreign enemy, really God's behind it. So that's the idea of zikron, being a day of judgment. So when you use those sukim and bamibar, it makes sense that um, Chazal's interpretation makes Dafka a lot of sense. Let's go back to the next question. And we're working backwards. No, I didn't want to stop the share. We got to go to chat. Chat, okay. Um, William Kirby, each begin with Vaidaber. Okay. That's actually, from what I said, it would be enough for a Dibor by Rosh Hashanah to the end. Um, why need one for Yom Kippur? But that's a little more complicated. The Dibor by Yom Kippur is only half Dibor. It's not the full one. Sukkot is going to have, we have to, Sukkot has two, a, a new Dibor because Sukkot has a double. Su, Sukkot's really complicated because it's presented twice. And because Sukkot is going to relate to, there's going to be a theme of Shabbatonim and a theme of, of uh, Mikrei Kodesh. And the new Dibor has to do with the, with the Shabbat element. Remember on Sukkot, it's seven days. I mean, it's uh, the first day and eighth day will be Mikra Kodesh in the first section, and the first eight day will be a Shabbaton in the second section, but that's too complicated for now. That needs a whole, a whole week, a whole hour share. Okay, uh, okay, and so we did this at judgment. We did that one. Regarding the laws of Omer, why wait for the actual Shabbat that occurs over Pesach? 
Uh, we could, but uh, I, I think it makes sense to connect it to Shabbat. I, you know, I'm not saying that's the only way to interpret it. I'm saying it's it's just a legitimate interpretation. My, my whole point was inserting Omer in the Moadim, because I understand that God's telling us connect the Moadim to Omer. And hence, when it says it, Omer has to do with Shabbat because the number seven and grain is all about seven and Shabbat and the Omer and the, and the mana experience. Why link it to the first day of Chagam of Chagamatzot? Because it's inserted in that unit. And when you appreciate the insertion in the middle of the unit of the Moadim, even though it's not a classic Moed because it doesn't have a lunar date, then it makes sense why Chazal are going to link the Shabbat there for the first day of Yom Tov of, of Chagamatzot. I'm not saying it's the only logical interpretation, but it's definitely as logical as making Shabbat Cholamod. Okay, uh, now Edmund. It appears that in Shabbat and Kiddush, the order is Breshit, Zechem is Breshit, from the Kodesh Vayikra and Shemot, no. No, Zechem is from, is from, um, from Devarim. No, it's the ten, Shabbat being Zechem is from is from the Ten Commandments in Devarim. Therefore, the order in Kiddush is Breshit, Zechem is Breshit, is, um, is Shemot, Tchem Ikra Kodesh Vayikra, and Zechem is Zechem is is going to be the Ten Commandments in Devarim. So the order is that way. And then now let's get to Abrad's question, which I didn't understand before. Oh, I have two questions. Uh, celebrate Sukkot, Passover in seven days, and Shavuot as one day. Oh, but how do we do the holidays outside of Israel? That's a whole different question. And with them, the holidays, in general, we celebrate the holidays outside of Israel. Was, that's the famous Ramban, that we're only doing it to remember what to do when we come back. So the, um, you know, it's, whether the holidays outside the land of Israel, which don't fit into this agricultural calendar, why we celebrate them? Like, what, why? You know, it's how do you celebrate the Shoshua Galim in the Southern Hemisphere? Because is, is, everything is upside down and the seasons are different. Um, and having this cycle, again, when having Chadash outside the land of Israel, when there's more than one agricultural cycle, grain cycle, also doesn't make much sense. So there's all these laws. There's just a bigger question of why we keep holidays outside the land of Israel when we're not living in an agricultural society, and even more so, even the land of Israel today when we're not living in an agricultural society anymore. But that's a, uh, that's a question about the development of halakha. And therefore, you can take those ideas and apply it in any situation. But again, I'm giving the, uh, the underlying reason of how the holidays began, how they develop over time. That's a topic for a much more complicated shear. Okay, um, I think we answered all this. Okay, any other questions, Rabbi? I don't think so. Okay. I, I do believe that the first question asked from the New World in the sixth, 17th century came was in Brazil. I remember I spoke about it before the Olympics in 2016. I think in 1654 it was sent to, you know, back to the, you know, to Europe. Um, what to do about um, when to say Mashiva Ruach, do they switch it to, you know, the, the summer, quote unquote, their winter, our summer, and uh, all these questions, you know, why, how does, you know, I'd say, I'd say what side is up and down and the Yetrog and the yeah. Lulav, all these uh, wild questions that are very important that we sort of ignore, but, uh, you know, people just say, just do what they did, but it's the, the logic was made to be kept here, that's all. I'm sorry, yeah, we do it the like... Like, but, this, but, listen, our Mashiva Ruach here doesn't make sense either. That's the famous, you know, the rush yeah. to change that. In you, I use, I use Mashiva Ruach to explain Israel's, Israel's Corona rules lockdown. I'm sorry? So have, I use Mashiva Ruach to explain Israel's rules now about the lockdown, about not people coming in from overseas. So right. there was, there's one rule for Bavel. Now, what happens? There's the law in Israel, the law for Bavel. And then once you, for Bavel, then all, all Chutzar says the Dina Bavel. So once Europe is red, so you're not going to make you plug this one, that one. So then everything's right. Because, I mean, Canada cases are getting way higher, but they're still way lower than whatever it's, uh, yeah, yeah. whatever. It's a, low, it's a low plug. You it's said this plug. country, that country, yeah. Yeah, Everyone Canada knows. lifted its travel restrictions from Africa, which I think was a good move because it was kind of apartheid, just to ban Africa and nobody else. That's what Canada okay. did. And, uh, you know, it's all over the place. I mean, to be, either you ban everybody or you ban nobody. That's, uh, I hear you. Yeah, that's it. It's a low plug. Yeah, low plug. But anyway, like yeah, the, these questions are very interesting. We've totally lost the agricultural motif of the holidays. Maybe in Israel, I don't know, people, maybe in the, especially in the non-observed, you know, in the non-Orthodox community, maybe they do that much more. With the Bikurim, I, I don't know. You can tell me, but uh, we yeah, seem to focus on the historical. The, 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 the challenge of the rabbis is to take the idea, the core, the core values still remain. 
Correct. And the idea that, that God judges us based on no, not only our agriculture, our whole economy and our health and our and, and politics and wars, etc., is all yeah. based in our deeds. So we can take, we can we, we have to, we need the booster shot of those ideas on a regular basis, under on a, on a, on a like routine over the year. So I can take those ideas and apply them on Yom Tov. Yeah, sure. and that's that's always the challenge of keeping the Torah relevant and modern and up to date. Yes, very good. Okay, please God, we'll see you next week, and uh, we'll see everybody else uh, next year. This week we have one shear a day through Friday. Uh, tomorrow, March, if you're a will, I'm ninety nine point nine 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 percent confident will be his last class in Shaul Lieberman. I was right, of course. Uh, I, mean, I shouldn't say that, but uh, you know, uh, last week was the second last class. Tomorrow will be the last class. We already have his next uh, series coming up, but that we'll announce a little later. And then uh, Tuesday, Jeremy England, his class on science, and Wednesday, Dr. Sokolo on the how Tanakh evolved. And Thursday, this week's part here, we'll be giving Rav, Rav Aviat Tabori a neighbor of Rabbi Leipzig. I don't know if he's going to be in America. I assume he's going to be in America or he's getting up at 3.30 in the morning. I don't know which one, um, but maybe it's recruiting season, although he can't come to America, so I don't know. Could I, be anyone, keep it to I said, Yeah, yeah, he, maybe he's flying to come to America. No, because all these shows are here. They're doing recruiting now. This is the time they come. They do recruiting. I know they've been coming here to Toronto, but whatever. Anyways, Rabbi where I know he will get, a, even if he's in Israel, I am quite confident he will have no problem getting up at three in the morning. Maybe I'll ask him if he wants to switch. We'll see. But uh, in the meantime, and then my sheer Friday morning, 9 a.m. on the sitter. And uh, we look forward to learning with you. And please invite a friend. And uh, okay, good to, good to see everybody. And everybody have a, a Shavuot. Be well, be healthy. And we look forward to learning with you. And uh, all kinds yeah. of people uh, as we move forward. Okay. And we work on our planning for 2022. All right. Thanks a lot.